Welcome to the inauguration of Accelerated Startup Academy. On this episode, we'll talk about why Twitter is the worst world of social media and not in a good way. I will also interview my good friend Sridhar Salur on consumer hardware startups. He's developed products and shipped millions of units and there's a very good chance you have one or more of his creations in your house right now. Buckle up, we're about to lift off with Accelerated Startup Academy episode one. Thank you for joining. I'm your host, Vitaly Golomb, author of the best-selling book by the same name, Accelerated Startup. I've advised many successful startups, accelerators, venture funds, and even some of the Fortune 100. I started young in Silicon Valley as an entrepreneur and then switched sides to corporate venture and now bring it all together by helping fast-growing companies raise money and find exits via M&A. I started Accelerated Startup Academy to dig deep into practical and tactical advice from some of the best subject matter experts out there. My goal is to help you unleash your potential by turning your ideas into products and those products into the next unicorn. If you haven't yet, hit subscribe on YouTube or in your favorite podcast app to be the first to know when future episodes drop. Now, we'll soon jump into the interview with my good friend and hardware product guru, Sridhar Solor on the two most important metrics in consumer products. But first, let's talk about Twitter. In the early 70s, the brilliant author and filmmaker Michael Crichton imagined a theme park where patrons could play out their fantasies without guilt or recourse. Though it contained Western, medieval, and Roman themes, the park and film were called Westworld. It was all fun and games until the androids became infected with a computer virus and decided to turn on their abusers. The powerhouse team of J.J. Abrams, Lisa Joy, and Jonathan Nolan incorporated Crichton's original vision along with his two lesser-known follow-ups and relaunched the series on HBO in 2016. The modern special effects that left little to the imagination and the updated storytelling style created a monster hit. Instead of a computer virus, this time the androids or hosts gained sentience and decided that they will no longer be victimized by their human patrons. Instead, they were determined to control their own destiny. Where the series goes beyond the original is in the latest season, where the hosts make a genius escape from the park into the real world. They exact very real revenge while the story slowly reveals them as unlikely protagonists. So with that setup, let's take a look at our real wild wild west with very real consequences that is Twitter. In his 2019 book, Antisocial, Online Extremists, Techno-Utopians, and the Hijacking of the American Conversation, journalist Andrew Morantz takes a deep dive into the alt-right Twitterverse and the real-world personas behind it. These trolls and outright fascists, once limited to their parents' basements, found each other and created movements with very real consequences we all live with now. The problem with an anonymous society where no rules apply is that the worst of human impulses tend to take over. That's what makes Westworld so believable. On Twitter, the unbridled mix of mental disease, insecurity, hate, and anti-intellectualism, all under the disassociated blanket of anonymity, show us the true dark side of humanity. MySpace was founded in Southern California in the summer of 2003. Facebook was born just six months later in a Harvard dorm. Though not the first social media company, MySpace took off like a rocket. It allowed netizens to take on online personas of their choosing and even express themselves by customizing profile pages. Facebook differentiated with an, at the time, novel concept of using real identities online. The two worlds could not be more different. One started as an analog of a college dorm, the other looked more like a bad neighborhood in a big city. Some may say it was the acquisition and subsequent hug of death by News Corp that led to the demise of MySpace. I believe instead Facebook hit escape velocity around the same time as they bet on making their online connections parallel real-world social networks that already existed in people's lives. Twitter was founded only two years after Facebook. Though it utilizes the now largely fringe concept of anonymity, it miraculously survived while MySpace faded away. As a business relative to its peers, Twitter has fallen far short of its potential. Its growth rate peaked in the second quarter of 2014, a year after it went public, and has been dropping ever since. In the same period, Twitter's revenue went from $1.4 billion to $3.5 billion annually as of Q1 2020, up just shy of 250%. Its market cap is in the low 20 billions and practically flat with where it was six years ago. Compare that with Facebook that went from 12.5 billion in 2014 to 73.4 billion as of Q1 2020, a 587% growth. 
Its market cap was $475 billion at the end of Q1 2020 and has climbed to over $600 billion as of the mid-May recovery from the March market route. Now, one would argue that little can compete with the Facebook juggernaut. Okay, let's take a look at Snap that was founded in the fall of 2011. In 2014, the company had just $3 million revenue for the whole year. As of Q1 this year, they did $1.9 billion and eclipsed Twitter's market cap. So it is safe to say that either Twitter is being mismanaged or that anonymous cesspools have limited market value. The bottom line results speak to the first part. Having personally run ad campaigns on most social network uh, media platforms, I can tell you that Twitter's commercial performance is orders of magnitude worse than any of the major platforms for online advertising. So where does that leave us and Twitter? Like most, I too have a Twitter presence, but it occupies less than 1% of my online time. Though it is advertised as an open platform to connect like-minded individuals, any useful function has long been copied and greatly improved upon by Facebook, LinkedIn, and newer entrants. What remains is a place where largely unhealthy biases get confirmed, trolls and bots take turns amplifying misinformation and noise that serve their agendas, irrespective of truth or reason, facts get hammered into the floor with fallacious arguments and false equivalents, clickbait journalists seek trends to write about without regards for positive societal value. It is the escalator of bullshit that elevated the ultimate con man into the most powerful position in the world. And he remains on the air Despite the blatant flouting of Twitter's terms of service, they've used as an excuse to craft their own version of free speech so many times before. At the end of the day, it is neither a good business nor something that provides a net positive to our society. Distractions of Jack Dorsey's tax-sheltered donations or work-from-home forever PR campaigns notwithstanding, Twitter is our Westworld, and these hosts are not rootable characters determined to fix the faults of humans that caused misbehavior in the theme park. They want to turn the real world into a parallel of their anything goes universe, and they are succeeding. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce my first guest on Accelerated Startup Academy, my good friend and consumer product guru, Sridhar Solur. He just became the GM of Berkshire Gray, a Lexington, Massachusetts-based industrial robotics company that recently closed a $263 million Series B round of funding. Their robots operate in flexible swarms to automate warehouses, just in time as e-commerce is consolidating its gains. Previously, Shri was the GM and Chief Product Officer of Shark Ninja, the leader in robotic appliances and food tech products where he took the company through IPO. There's a good chance you have a shark vacuum or a ninja kitchen appliance in your home right now. Now, Before that, he was the head of product for Comcast Digital Home. If you're in the U.S., there's a good chance you have one of his routers or home security systems at home. And before that, he built an entire career at HP where he developed mobile printing and built a smartwatch business in partnership with Movado, Hugo Boss, Titan, Coach, Ferrari, and others before the Apple Watch was even born. He has been recognized by the Inc. magazine as a top 20 influencers. I can go on and on. Mostly, I'm proud to call Shri a friend. Here's our discussion. Welcome, Shri, to Accelerate Startup Academy. Thanks for being on the show. Let's dive right into it. Uh, how do you validate a consumer hardware idea? It's, it's fairly straightforward. Two things that you need to remember. Just two things. One, everything on the product that you have in your mind in terms of product, you know, market match is a hypothesis till you actually validate it. Second, don't ever let the consumer design your product. You design, you have a set of hypothesis, then listen all along the way. So if somebody is starting out for the first time and let's say they're a new entrepreneur and it's, and they really have a hardware idea, um, what do you think, or what are the, some of those first steps, and then how do they move to uh, making it a reality? What's the next step after that? Simple. It's a stage gate process. It's, it's fairly straightforward. One is you have a prototype. Get a prototype, something that's fairly easy, quick, and get it in front of a consumer. And then you build a prototype, you know, whether it's P0. Uh, and then get that in front of a consumer, you know. Uh, again, there are, there are a set of hypotheses 
and that needs to get validated in every stage gate, every part of the stage gate process. So you would start from prototype, P0, P1, P2, and since this is hardware, you know, you're gonna go invest money in tooling. But before you go into the tooling stage where you're gonna put a lot of money because you know you wanna build this product in volumes, you wanna make sure that this product has two things. Always remember for any product, you just need two things. One is high rate of sale. Two is high consumer satisfaction. Simple, nothing else. To have high rate of sale, you want to make sure that it's commercially viable. You know, your FOB costs are, you know, gives you uh, a lot of leeway and you can make money on it and the consumers are not going to be sticker shocked. And for high consumer satisfaction, it's all aspects of the product should delight the consumer. So we'll come back to some of the key metrics on the marketing side and how to evolve the product in a little bit more detail in a second. But uh, you know, for a lot of uh, startups getting into this, they don't necessarily have all the skill sets under one roof. It could be somebody with an idea, maybe their software guy or gal, or just a hardware person that doesn't have the software piece. We know that most consumer products especially have the entire stack. They have the hardware, they have the software, probably mobile connected. You need a lot of different skill sets. What would be your guidance for what would you keep core versus what you can safely outsource um, to, to companies that can do it better and quickly. Anything that is strategic to you, that's you need to keep it. Everything depends on the product. Things that are not strategic, you can outsource and seek outside help. Yeah. To give you an example, manufacturing, you know, we'll, we'll talk about manufacturing at some point in time. Uh, if, if it is very, very strategic, you're going to vertically integrate and you're going to manufacture this yourself. Uh, if not, you're going to outsource that. Uh, and again, there is another thing is depending on the maturity of the product in the marketplace. You know, some things are strategic, some things are can be outsourced. So it depends from product to product. Contract manufacturing obviously is is a factor that comes up at a certain point and relatively early on. This this uh, helps you to deal with you know this is a must on the cost. Most of your costs are going to go there. And you need somebody reliable. You need somebody who will help you finance the manufacturing itself. If you're a startup, they won't take money up front. You know, what are some of the key considerations that you would uh, say are in um, finding the right contract manufacturer? And what are the important things to think about when you're managing them on a day-to-day -day basis and rely on them for your company? So two things. One is you don't need a contract manufacturing company uh, to start with. To, just to give you an example, there are hardware accelerators, you know, who will help you find that uh, depending on uh, what you want to do. So that's that's number one. The second one is you have tier two, tier three factories that can potentially give you a better return on investment, you know, at, at a much lower cost. But, you know, quality of the product is something that you need to have a keen eye on. So the summary here is, Contract manufacturing, it's very easy to jump in and say, look, you know, I'm going to work with this contract manufacturer. Great. But then, you know, do you have like a big wallet is a big question. So if you don't do that, you also have an option of working with, you know, multiple tier two and tier three factories in, um, you know, in, in China, Malaysia, Thailand, India. And, uh, you know, all you need to do there is make sure that you have a keen eye for quality. So you can go either way and it doesn't have to be contract manufacturing all the time. And on a day-to-day -day basis, let's say you do find somebody who you start working with and they are on the other side of the world. Um, what are some of your kind of quick and easy tips that you can give somebody for helping manage that relationship? Yeah, uh, nothing like walking the streets, uh, knowing you know uh, the people who own the company uh, I can easily tell you that unless you have built a personal relationship with a factory, unless you make sure that the owner of the factory is invested in the pro product as such, who is involved in day-to-day -day operations, you know, who's going to stand at the line, you know, who's going to look at the first pass yield, you know, who's going to be like talking to you as much as you talk to your spouse, uh, 
that is the kind of relationship you need to have. The problem with you know some of the contract manufacturing and also the problem with you know some of the factory owners are they are not involved in the day to day. Being in the details is very important, and you want to make sure that your manufacturing partner is in the details. It's not like one weekly review. It's twice a day you're talking to the factory. Um, and the owner of the factory should take personal interest of sorts. And look, I mean, that's possible. And that's the reason you've seen some of the products that we have brought into market in the last few years. You know, you will see all of them are like four plus stars uh, and very high rate of sale. And the only way to do that is make sure after you go into tooling, when you start doing the engineering builds, you know, after tooling, you do EB0, EB1, EB2, and then you go into mass production. You want to make sure that you have at least one person or a squad living and breathing during your EB builds in the factory. I repeat, you know, between tooling and mass production, you have to live in the factory, period. So let's shift over to the other side of it. Uh, what are some of the first steps? Let's say the product is manufactured, it's in your hands, you have the app, you're ready to go to market. What are some of the first steps in marketing the product? You don't start at that time. You start at the pre-totide stage. Even in the pre-totide stage, look, I have seen some great products, but the messaging is so bad that the consumers either don't understand or, you know, the 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 messaging is not tailored to what the product actually does. So the summary is in the pre-totype stage, in the P1 stage, in the P2 stage, and much before tooling, you need to have the messaging piece at least validated. What is the messaging going to look on the box? How is it going to look on the shelf? You know, if it's, if it's going to be sold via retail, how is it going to look on the web? You know, the digital piece and Conduct pilots on social media, you know, do a controlled pilot on the messaging piece, you know, have, have like a short form, uh, a rough short form that's created and, and basically get consumers to watch it and let them give feedback. You know, it's, it's, it's really amazing how marketing of the product needs to start right at the same time as you're creating the product, almost around the same time, let me put it this way. And at every point in time, you have to do a price sensitivity analysis because it might be, remember the two things, high rate of sale, high consumer satisfaction. And high rate of sale comes with products that are priced right. And then high consumer satisfaction comes when I've built robots. The problem is, you need to teach the consumer. You, you need to let, you know, you, you got to walk the consumer through a journey of onboarding the robot. And there are many places, if you don't explain, and even when you build an app, and, and Vitaly, you have built many of these, you know, you have to make sure that the consumer actually understands. It's so intuitively obvious that you remove all the friction along the way. And again, build the messaging you know, much, much, much early. I would say six months before the product launch, you know, you need to be iterating on the messaging piece. And the messaging is sometimes not just on the box. It's not out of band, or, you know, you know, short form advertising. You know, the messaging is in the product. It's in the app, you know, and the onboarding piece and things like that. So the summary is messaging needs to start much earlier. Marketing needs to start much earlier. Point taken. Yeah, I think that's probably uh, counterintuitive. A lot of people kind of break down their process. They want to build their idea first and then start marketing it. But um, it's probably, yeah, you'll be probably well served to start at the same time and get that feedback. Absolutely. Outside. Absolutely. Just like uh, before, Waterfall software development was took 18 months to push something out just to be surprised that nobody cares. Yeah, with hardware kind of being more agile. What are your thoughts on crowdfunding platforms, the use of Kickstarter, Indiegogo? And then what are your thoughts on kind of retail versus Amazon, Amazon being the kingmaker for a lot of the consumer products? 
if we can share briefly kind of some ideas on, you know, where do you put your emphasis when you're developing products? Might be a great opportunity to raise money. Um, and, and secondly, uh, it may be also a great opportunity to validate some of your assumptions. The question too is Amazon versus retailers. It's, it's the right things on the wall. You can actually see where things are, you know, right now. Uh, I wouldn't call this Amazon versus retailers for now while say brick and mortar versus online. Uh, we all know where things are. The online revolution started, uh, you know, 20 years ago with e-commerce. Uh, and since then we have seen a spectacular array of brick and mortar companies closing its doors. Um, and so that evolution is gonna continue um, and even in robotics, just to give you an example, if you compare brick and mortar versus Amazon, 60% of robots are sold via Amazon. Let me put it this way. Let, let that sink in. A billion dollars of robots, you know, robotic vacuum cleaners are sold uh, today in the United States, right? Billion dollars. 60% of that is sold through Amazon. So you would say for somebody just starting out with a new idea that retail is probably not something they need to worry about uh, first and foremost, certainly. Uh, the packaging in the retail environment and, and learning how to sell into the big box stores, you think that's probably not something that's high priority at first? Would you say that? No, it depends on the product. You know, I want to be careful about that. It, it absolutely depends on the product. Uh, it depends on the buying journey of the consumer. Uh, even today, there's a demographic uh, or a psychographic that would like to walk into a retail store, touch and feel. Um, well, and, and Amazon has retail stores right now. Uh, there, there's a reason for that. So I really think there is a place for brick and mortar like retailers. Um, and again, it depends on which part of the world you are in, right? In Japan, they have the rail side and the city side stores like when people just get off the trains they they produce through the stores so it is very important to have presence in in the rail side stores especially for consumer products and and when when you go into stores in in uh, urban locations uh you have a person who will explain to you how the product works for like you know 15 20 minutes and there are people who actually listen to that and then you know, they come back and buy uh, either online or in a retail store. The summary is buying behaviors still is very different in, in many parts of the world. Uh, so if you have a product that's a worldwide product, you want to be careful about, you know, how it is sold in the U.S. And what's good for the goose is not good for the gander. So how things are sold in the U.S. versus how things are sold in Japan and Germany, it's like vastly different. And, uh, but definitely, you know, online is taking off and, uh, you know, you got to get really creative about getting your presence felt online. We'll be right back for the rest of the interview. I've had the opportunity to meet and train entrepreneurs in over 30 countries. I found that they're all pretty much the same, tireless, driven, irrationally optimistic. They may have different accents, but the challenges are always the same. And I wanted to make all of the secrets of Silicon Valley success available to anyone. Accelerated Startup is my blueprint for you to go from idea to product to company the next time you want to change the world. Make no mistake about it, if you're working on a problem worth solving, by definition, no one has ever done exactly what you're about to do. This book is filled with practical advice that comes from years of blood, sweat and tears in the entrepreneurial trenches. Accelerators and business schools use it as a textbook. Thousands of entrepreneurs have used it as their guiding light to get past the challenges faster. So you want my advice? Grab your ebook, hardcover, paperback, or audiobook version on Amazon or iBooks today. And then send me an email with your questions at asa at golem.net. So let's let's shift gears a little bit. So let's say the product is out in the marketplace, and uh, let's say you have these early tests where you're starting to test the messages, 
and you still have some flexibility in manufacturing and making changes to the product. So I guess there's kind of the, the before and after. Let's say, how do you deal with uh, this early feedback and how do you um, integrate it into the product? What, what are some of the key things you're looking for from consumers? And then also when the product is finally out and out there um, in consumers' hands and you get some, some feedback on some things that you might have missed and you're thinking of version 2.0, how do you integrate that feedback as well? Yeah, first of all, face all feedback. Uh, the consumer is always right. Uh, I've seen many product creators who think that, uh, you know, the consumer doesn't know or doesn't understand they, uh, that product creators should take that out of their vocabulary. Uh, number one, respond diligently. You know, you, you get a one star, you get a two star review, respond, you know, face it, accept mistakes. The consumer is always right. But then quickly solve the problem and talk to that consumer one on one, you know, either through your call center, either through your social feedback. Um, remember this, if you were to lose one star on Amazon, it's like 25% of your business is lost. Do not take that lightly. Most importantly, do not try to influence, right? Get honest feedback. At the end of the day, you're not trying to be like a one trick pony or you're, you're trying to sell some product off for one year and you're not going to come back again. So no tricking. The, the ratings. I have seen a lot of companies, you know, uh, basically trying to manipulate and, you know, trying to um, bundle reviews, unbundle reviews. Uh, there are legal tools and there are illegal tools of manipulating reviews. Do not, do not do that because at the end of the day, you need to create an honest product that consumers actually love. And that should be your goal. Unless you have that in your DNA, you're not a good product manager, right? So Amazon review is really good. You know, you, you can actually, in many ways, when you look at reviews on other sites, you can manipulate those reviews, right? You, you can have friendlies, you know, you can have people, you send the product to them, they go and, and create, you know, five-star reviews for you. And before the product is in the marketplace, there are many companies that flood you with five star reviews. You know, that's okay. You know, I'm telling you that's okay to do it, but you can't do that with Amazon. So for me, the true north is Amazon review. Most importantly, any review that comes in, you need to take a good look at it and you have an, a great chance to like create the next version of the product uh, that's amazing. So read every reviews you know every product manager has to read all the reviews and if they have not you know they're they they're not really true to their profession so the summary is if you look at how products are created you have an engineering org on one side uh, you have a product org on the other you have consumer insights and you have the marketing team you know that's your trapezoid and in there there needs to be that creative tension all the time you know and that tension has to be on the side of the consumer if you don't have that in your organization you're not going to be successful bringing a product with high rate of sale and high consumer satisfaction so on the flip side let's say you do get out there and you unfortunately you know it's an early version of a product there's some bugs in it and customer service can't keep up and you get some bad reviews what do you do always respond acknowledge have a site to basically first went up, went their frustration. Look, even if you see one bad review, trust me, that is going to multiply once it's Thanksgiving or, you know, after Black Friday or, you know, in consumer products, that is going to be like 100 bad reviews. And very quickly, you're going to go down. The thing that you need to do is solve for those problems. The beauty of problems with software and hardware is, Software can compensate for some of the hardware shortcomings. And when you build a product with both hardware, software connected to the cloud, you have a lot of levers that you can pull, a lot of levers. And you have the, and plus an app, come on. So if there are shortcomings in the hardware, I can give you a great example. You know, if, if you have an issue with the Wi-Fi chipset and you know that in, during onboarding, it does not support a specific way of onboarding 
um, you know, your device. You have an app. An app can compensate for that, you know. So you need to have an action register of all the problems, all the issues. After MP, if your backlog for high and highest to solve for consumer issues, I'm just making this up, is not, you know, over a dozen pages, there is something wrong, you know. The point is, you know, you have to solve for every one-star review. Every one-star review. You know, if you've built a product, a good product, you, you will, and, and if your heart is in the right place, the consumers are actually very forgiving. You know, you just have to make sure that you communicate. Yeah, it's good old customer service, right? Basics. If you get unhappy customers, you try to figure out how to make them happy quickly, not just ignore them just because they're online. Let's talk a little bit about numbers and growth metrics. So for uh, for those of, for those getting into consumer hardware for the first time, you know, what are some of the good growth metrics that you would look for? When do you know that you have a hit on your hands? You know, and uh, you know, this is very important for first time entrepreneurs going to investors. How do they know that it's working and it's something exciting and something worth funding and scaling? Uh, you know, you have a hit on your hands when uh, you have high consumer satisfaction and you run out of inventory. You know, very simple. Like you plan for something and then it's uh, October, November, December, and you're like, oh, oh God, you know what? I, I have a 4.5 star product and I can't make enough of them. It's it's the best place to be, you know. That's the way to spend your uh, you know time between Thanksgiving and Christmas or your Christmas holidays, right? I mean, I'm talking about the North American buying season. Run out of inventory. The next thing is, have you taken market share? Uh, so that's number two. Three. This is super unique, Vitali. I'll tell you. In three scenarios. You know, we have brought product to market or I've personally been involved bringing a product to market. And you know what happens? The incumbent, right? The person who owns a giant market share sues you. You know, that's a rite of passage. You know, you get sued. That's a great thing, mate. You know, and, and I'm, I'm saying this because you're a threat. You're a threat. But when you build a product, make sure you respect all the boundaries of intellectual property and things like that. But it's always a rite of passage. Your competition is going to throw speed bumps. You know, when we were doing smart watches, there were companies coming out of the woodwork from uh, Switzerland, you know, trying to sue you. So that's an uh, that's, uh, interesting, non-obvious uh, KPI. Getting sued is not necessarily bad. You're actually getting attention of competitors in the market. And uh, they might be messing with you, might be part of their strategy maybe save a little money for that uh, inevitability if you're successful. Yeah, now, I mean, that, that is difficult for a startup. You know, that can be super daunting if you get a cease and desist by a big giant corporation. The way to protect yourself is never violate IP. You know, do your homework. Do your homework early on and develop a product that is built on your own credentials. Yeah. So do you think uh, doing patent searches and understanding your competitors and what's protected and proprietary, is that part of the development process? At what point do you look at that in the development process? Uh, in, the, in the prototype stage, because look, you need to make sure that the IP scene is like kind of clear by the time you hit tooling. Because remember, tooling, you are investing money in tooling. And that is a lot of money that you're going to put in, you know, when you tool a product. So the summary is before tooling, you need to have a very clear idea about the, the IP landscape and where you're, you know, where you're going to be. Because after tooling, you spent a lot of money, mate. So uh, much before tooling, in the prototype stage, gate stage, you need to make sure that you're clear on your intellectual property or you know ways around it. Yeah, that's huge. And uh, I mean, that's kind of a non-obvious point that uh, startup founders, without that experience of having gone through that process and maybe getting sued out of existence, they don't realize that this is an important factor. Can you name a few other non-obvious things that founders need to keep in mind? A, a few points. One, always do a pre-mortem, right? Think of everything that can go wrong. Trust me, it will go wrong. So if your list is, say, a dozen, You've not done your homework. Your pre-mortem list has to be in the hundreds. 
So think about all the things that can go wrong. The second thing that I'm going to highlight is be productively paranoid. I know the propensity to celebrate is so easy and so comforting. Celebrations are good, but always be productively paranoid about things that can go wrong. Three is map out a risk dashboard. It's very simple. On the x-axis, you have probability. Y-axis, you have impact. Highlight high probability, high impact risks. Hardware, software, operational, intellectual property. And for every high probability, high impact risk, make sure you have a strategy to mitigate, monitor, or transfer that risk. For all the other risks, you want to make sure you monitor it at least. Next is celebrate failures. You know, I love the concept of black box thinking. Think of it this way, right? Flying on planes is so easy. You know, it's so safe. In the 1915s, you know, 50% of takeoffs would like, you know, end up in a crash. And look at where we are right now. And now, if there is like a, a near collision or a near accident scenario, it doesn't matter between Embraer or Airbus or Boeing. You know, people openly talk to each other and there's a protocol that's developed so that it never, ever, ever happens again. But in healthcare, what happens is, you know, people try to hide and look at the number of people who die just because, you know, wrong drugs are being administered. Look, any issue that you find in the product in, in, in the P stages or the EB stages, celebrate that because you have found an issue before a consumer finds an issue. So that is a mindset that I don't see many people, you know, having that mindset on finding issues and celebrating that. That's really, really important. Product creation is not easy. If you see smoke anywhere during the product development process, you know, if you think it's a minor issue, it is not. Trust me, the 100% that's going to come to bite you later. So there's nothing called minor issues in any of the P builds, any of the EB builds. You know, all issues, you got to look at it as, as major issues. And be consistent, you know, progress over perfection. It's like, don't try to create a masterpiece. Every week, every day, you want to make sure that your project is moving further. If you're not moving towards the goal every day, you know, irrespective of whether it's a weekend or not, it's you're not going to bring a product to market, especially a hardware product into market, a consumer product into market in nine to 10 months. It's never going to happen. You know, your product your life cycle will become 18 months, 20 months, and then you'll have a competitor somewhere else, you know, who, who's going to like outpace you. So you need to move fast, progress over perfection. The non-obvious thing, which everybody knows it's obvious but they still don't do it is having the right people on the bus it's so important that you know get the right people on the bus you know who can take honest feedback you don't want ruinous empathy you don't want people who are like being massively aggressive um you know people who are trying to be assholes but you want people who give you honest feedback you know it's mostly cultural most of this is mindset based you know having a mindset that has progress over perfection, productive paranoia. Look at this as a risk dashboard. Just having the right people on the bus is so important. And I see that being an issue. It's not about having a great idea. Great ideas are dime a dozen. Execution is where people fail. So be an amazing executor. Awesome. Thank you for that. I've been in Silicon Valley and on all sides of the table for over 20 years now. I've known you for almost half that time and I've learned a ton. Thank you very much for being on Sorry Startup Academy podcast and I appreciate your insights and I think our audience will also really appreciate the insights. So with that, thank you very much and talk to you soon. Thank you, Vitaly. Thank you for having me. Thanks for checking out the first episode of Accelerated Startup Academy. If you haven't yet, now is the perfect time to hit that subscribe button. If you'd like to learn more about working with me, visit golom.net, G-O-L-O-M-B.net. Want to be featured on the next episode? Think of a great question on startups, venture capital, or innovation, and send it as a voice recording to asa at golom.net. See you in the next episode. For now, I wish you great success.